Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining our OFA webinar. I will now turn it over to James Butler to get us started. James? Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us for today's webinar, Increasing Employment Outcomes for TANF Recipients with Substance Abuse Use Disorders. And we are delighted to present a panel of presenters to discuss this topic with you today. Um, as mentioned, I am James Butler, and I serve as one of the program specialists here in the Office of Family Assistance. And I will be facilitating today's webinar. Um, today's webinar outlines employment-focused strategies that can contribute to, rather than inhibit, substance use treatment. Um, the webinar features an array of experts with backgrounds in research and practice on working with TANF recipients who have substance use disorders. We're going to start the webinar with Dennis Romero, who serves as the Regional Administrator at Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration, better known as SAMHSA, which falls under the umbrella of the United States Department of Health and Human Services. Dennis will provide an overview of SAMHSA's role in advancing the behavioral health of the nation and discuss some national trends around substance use. Following Dennis, Dr. Christine Caulfield, who serves as the Chief Executive Officer at Lutheran Services Florida, will talk about Florida's managing entity model of behavioral health service delivery and analyze current practices, challenges, and insights regarding the use of TANF dollars for substance use treatment. We'll then wrap it up with Kim Relaford, who serves as the Project Director for Kentucky Targeted Assessment Program better known as TAP, will provide data around the prevalence of substance use disorders among TANF recipients, explore coexisting employment barriers, and outline TAP's case management strategies and referral and collaboration systems. So you'll see on the screen before you some of our learning objectives. Uh, we're hoping to share some of the national trends in substance use explore employment-focused strategies for substance use treatment, um, identify some possible strategies that you can consider to design and implement a case management and referral program and of customers with opioid slash substance use disorders, and share some lessons learned and best practices from programs that successfully implemented dairy rem remediation and work readiness activities with end of customers that have opioid substance use disorders. So what I'd like to do now is quickly review how to use GoToWebinar. Um, you'll see in your upper right corner of your screen a control panel. You can minimize or enlarge the control panel by clicking on the orange arrow. By expanding the control panel, you can scroll to the bottom to type any questions you may have and provide responses to our polling questions. Please enter your questions throughout the webinar and indicate which speaker you'd like to respond to your questions if, if that be the case. We will monitor your questions and address them during our Q&A session. We're also gonna launch several polls throughout the presentation, um, which you can respond to by clicking on the radio button next to your preferred response. We'll leave each poll question open for approximately 30 seconds, and then we will have someone um, read the results of the poll responses. What I'd like to do now is share a little bit more with you about each of our presenters before we start. Dennis Romero serves as the Regional Administrator at the Region 2 for the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, again, SAMHSA which is an operating division of the Depart U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. His role, um, he represents uh, the Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Use at the regional level in fulfilling the agency's mission of reducing the impact of mental illness and substance use on America's communities. He provides authoritative advice and assistance on behavioral health policy and in for use in the delivery and financing of prevention, treatment, and recovery services, develops regional perspectives on SAMHSA initiatives, 
and is a visible advocate for individuals with mental illnesses and substance use dis disorders with the federal government and the region. We will then hear from Christine Caulfield, who serves as the CEO of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Managing Entity at Lutheran Services Florida. She also serves as co-chair on Florida's Optimal Aging and Mental Health Board, President of Florida Council on Aging, President of Florida Association of Managing Entities, and member on the Executive Board for Brain Injury Florida and Smart Justice of Top of all of that, she's a writer. We will then hear from Kim Griswold Relliford who serves as project director for Kentucky Targeted Assessment Program, again, known as TAP. Kim has been with the University of Kentucky Center on Drug and Alcohol Research and the TAP since 2000 in direct service and development and management roles over 20 years of experience, assisting TANF recipients and TANF eligible parents with substance use disorders um, to overcome barriers to employment. In addition to her work with TAP, um, she currently is an adjunct professor at the University of Kentucky College of Social Work, Maryland Connolly School of Social Work at Brescia University, and the Indiana University School of Social Work. So without further ado, I will turn your attention over now to Dennis Romero. Dennis, you have the floor. Thank you, James, um, and thank you for those kind introductions. I also want to express my thanks to ACF and the Office of Family Assistance uh, uh, for inviting me to this national webinar. And I'm also honored to be on the panel with uh, individuals so committed to this to their work and who are experts in their own right. Uh, to my co-panelists, I am looking forward to learning from you as well today. What I hope to do today is to offer a glimpse of what the behavioral health landscape looks like relative to substance use and abuse. But we cannot look at the entire picture of addiction unless we also consider mental health for reasons that are beyond the scope of this presentation, but nonetheless are closely interrelated. Uh, next slide, please. The yeah. Uh, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration leads the public health efforts to advance the behavioral health of the nation. It is for these reasons that our mission is to reduce the impact of substance misuse and abuse on America's communities. SAMHSA accomplishes this through providing leadership and resources, resources in the form of programs, policies, information and data, funding and personnel to advance the mental and substance use disorder prevention, treatment, and recovery services in order to improve individual, community, and public health. SAMHSA has a unique responsibility to focus on these preventable and treatable conditions, which, if, if unaddressed, lead to significant individual, societal, and economic consequences. We operationalize our mission by helping states, tribal nations, cities, municipalities, the provider community and policy decision, decision makers act on the knowledge that behavioral health is essential to health, that prevention and the science of prevention does work, that treatment is effective, and that recovery is possible for all. Next slide, please. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services divides the nation into 10 regions. Each region, uh, is, a, uh, uh, each region is appointed uh, by an agency lead from their respective agencies uh, at the regional level. I currently serve as the Region 2 Regional Administrator, which encompasses the states of New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Since this is a national webinar, I want to make sure you know where your SAMHSA regional office is located who the original, regional administrator is, and how to connect with the original office. Next slide, please. So let's get started. Let's look at the landscape regarding substance use in the United States today. When we look at the most recent data from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, we can see where we need to continue devoting our efforts and resources. 
For example, we need to continue our focus on the ongoing opioid epidemic, or as I like to say, the ongoing addiction crisis. We also need to focus on the rising uh, rates of marijuana and methamphetamine, particularly in adults uh, ages 26 and older. The, rise rate, the rising rates of major depression in adolescents and adults ages 18 to 49 years of age. The increased risk for using other hazardous substances and having mental illness when using these illicit substances. We also need to focus on mental illness as a whole as a risk factor for illicit substance use. And we also need, for, need to focus for ongoing efforts in prevention of substance use disorders. Next slide, please. Let's look at how our efforts are affecting youth substance use, especially related to the emerging issues such as marijuana. And for young people's use of cigarettes and alcohol remain long-standing issues of concern for us. The uh, National Survey, Survey in Drug Use and Health data shows us that at uh, shows us the age at which people first start misusing a particular substance over the past year. We can see these uh, ages of first uh, use in mind. We should keep these uh, ages of first use in mind when we consider our prevention strategies relative to specific substances. For example, most people had used marijuana for the first time between the ages of, seven, uh, of 12 to 17, with 1.3 million adolescents using it for the first time. Alcohol was the, the other substance with the most uh, initiates falling in that age group with 2.4 million starting to drink during those teenage years. Prescription pain relievers and heroin are the only substances in this group that people are more likely to start using when they are uh, 26 or older, with 1.9 million starting to use uh, of pain relievers in their mid-20s and 75,000 beginning using heroin. One important note, however, is that while alcohol use among young people is def definitely a concern, we need to keep an eye out for the fact that stimulants are on the rise again, and in some instances, is surpassing alcohol at age of first onset. We also need to focus on, uh, on use across the lifespan as well. An article recently published in the journal Alcoholism Clinical and Exper Experimental Research noted that recent studies indicate that alcohol use is actually increasing more among middle age and older adults than it is among younger groups. So we can't forget to pay attention to what may be driving these increases and how we can support prevention efforts related to older groups as well. Next slide, please. Let's take a snapshot of, of, of the opioid misuse uh, in 2018. What do we know now? Well, we know that 3.7% of people ages 12 and older misused opioids in the past year. That's equivalent to approximately 10.3 million people. Uh, among adolescents, it was 2.8%, which was lower than in 2015 and 2016, but similar to the percentages in 2017. Among young adults ages 18 to 25, it was 5.6%. This percentage was lower than the percentages in 2015 to 2017. And among adult, uh, adults ages 26 and older, it was 3.6%. Percentage is similar to the percentages in 2017. As this graph shows, the decrease in past year opioid misuse indicates a need to monitor trends to assess whether the annual estimates will stabilize at the level of 2018, show further decrease, or increase to levels similar to those of 2015 to 2017. Next slide, please. This slide. Uh, shows trends in underage drinking in relation to key milestones. And I'll come back to the milestones in a minute. The red line shows past month alcohol use for 12 to 17 year olds from the 2002 through 2018. Uh, by the way, the red line data comes from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, which is, comes out of SAMHSA. The blue line shows past month alcohol use for 12th graders from 1976 through 2018. 
This data comes from the Monitoring uh, the Future survey funded by the National Institutes of Drug Abuse uh, at HHS. Uh, since trendable uh, NISDA data is not available before 2002. Although 12th, grader, uh, although 12th grade use is higher uh, than used by 12 to 17 year olds, both lines are clearly showing a downward trend. What were the factors? This data is directly linked to sound public health policy implementation. And what do I mean by that? In 1984, uh, we had the adoption of the Federal Minimum Legal Drinking Age Act in 1987 was the year by which all states had adopted a minimum legal drinking age of 21. In 2004, the Interagency Coordinating Committee on the Prevention of Underage Drinking was formed and SAMHSA was named the lead agency. And then in 2006, the Sober Truth on Preventing Underage Drinking Act was passed also known as the STOPPED Act. And SAMHSA was once again identified as the lead agency. The law for, uh, formalized the uh, Interagency co Coordinating Committee and required detailed annual reports on national and state underage drinking and on state performance and best practices. It also required a national media campaign aimed at adults and provided for community grants to prevent underage drinking. The STOP Act was reauthorized in 2016 by the 21st Century Cures Act, and SAMHSA was again identified as the lead agency. Next slide, please. So, <clears throat> so here uh, I wanted to just focus very briefly on our resources that's available through SAMHSA to ensure that the behavioral health provider field and the community at large have the resources and tools needed for this very important work you can find all of our resources on the SAMHSA store at store.samhsa.gov. On this site, you can access resources, toolkits, pamphlets, and guiding documents, just to name a few. What you see in this slide is just a glimpse of what you can find on our e-store, and it's all for free. Next slide. As I briefly alluded uh, to at the beginning of this presentation, our data collection, evaluation, and analyses helps to inform better decision-making in the behavioral health sector and beyond. The types of data sets that we, that we manage and collect and evaluate include the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, the Treatment Episode Data Set, the National Mental Health Services Survey, the National Survey of Substance Abuse Treatment Services, the Drug Abuse Warning Network, the Mental Health Diet uh, Client Level da Data, Uniform Reporting System, and the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Data Archives. These are the rich, data-rich resources you can access from your computer to make data-driven decisions. As an example, the Behavioral Health Barometer, Volume 5, brings together the most recent national, regional, and, and state-specific behavioral health indicators as measured through the National Survey on Drug Use and Health and the National Survey of Substance Abuse Treatment Services. The behavioral health barometers help to paint an accurate picture of the racial, ethnic breakdowns, provides a comparison snapshot of, of substance use disorder and mental health at the state, region, and at the national levels, and provides a powerful overview of behavioral health prevalence use that could look at uh, serious thoughts of suicide, serious mental illness, and related treatment. And by the way, the most recent behavioral health barometer were, were published in 2019. So on the left side of the screen, you're seeing the national behavioral health barometer. On the right side of the screen, what you see is the New York State specific uh, behavioral health barometer. And I just pulled that one up only because I am in the state of New York. And I wanted uh, uh, you to see how your state specific um, barometer would look like. Finally, uh, uh, next slide, please. Um, we try to make it easy for people to access care and access services. Through our website, uh, you can access uh, information on helplines, hope lines, warm lines relative to suicide, mental health, and substance abuse. We also have a treatment locator, which is a, uh, a, an incredible database that brings together information about mental health facilities, 
substance abuse treatment facilities, uh, community uh, health clinics, and the VA. Um, and you can access any or all of those uh, services uh, with just a couple of clicks um, of information. We obviously have a 24-7 treatment referral line that it can also help you uh, access uh, care. And we also uh, have a tremendous focus in the area of disaster distress uh, support. Uh, I'm also providing a list of other uh, sites within SAMHSA for access uh, services uh, that, that may be of benefit uh, to you. Um, and then finally, um, I also want to just acknowledge and, and highlight uh, that we also carry and have for free uh, available um, the uh, mobile apps. We have a number of mobile apps that are available. We have one that prepares uh, the adult person for one of the most important conversations you may ever have with your kids or children about underage drinking. We call it a Talk They Hear You Now. We have an opioid and heroin uh, addiction uh, mobile app called MATX. We have a suicide prevention app. It's called Suicide Safe. We have a, um, a, a, a disaster behavior health app uh, that focuses on trauma-informed strategies for children, families, and communities who experience nat uh, natural or man-made disasters. We have a no bullying, uh, that's K-N-O-W, bullying. Uh, and research shows that parents and caregivers who spend at least 15 minutes a day talking with their children or teens help build stronger relationships. And that translates to helping uh, boost a, child, a child's confidence, resilience, and build effective strategies for facing bullying. And our No Bullying app helps, helps you in that, in that path. Finally, we have an app called Alcohol FX, which looks at the alcohol effects on the brain and provides in, in simple language the impact of alcohol uh, that will have on uh, a brain. And although not specifically part of this presentation, I also want to highlight the importance of financial literacy and having that conversation with children as, as, as well. You know, research clearly demonstrates children who are encouraged to become more financially literate are less likely to enter the, uh, the social safety net systems. Just some food for thought uh, for your consideration. Uh, and then last slide, please. Um, and I just want to thank you again uh, for allowing me uh, to be part of this uh, uh, panel this morning or this afternoon, actually. Um, and so that, so this concludes my presentation, and I will uh, turn this over back to uh, the moderator. Thank you very much, Dennis. Thanks. That was that was great. Thanks for helping us understand SAMHSA's role in advancing the behavioral health of the nation, and for uh, giving us an overview of the prevalence of substance use. Uh, we want to make this an interactive webinar for all of you. So this is our first polling question. Uh, and it is, how prevalent are opioid substance use disorders amongst the customers you serve? And your options are very prevalent, somewhat prevalent, uh, or not prevalent. Uh, and we'll give you the opportunity to uh, post uh post your views on the actual screen so hold on one second okay see the votes are coming in All right, so we have, looks like 57% for somewhat prevalent, 28% not prevalent, and 15% very prevalent. So there are a good distribution, but somewhat seems to be the most 
popular poll. All right, so let's move on to our next presenter, uh, Dr. Caulfield, who will share Florida's managing entity model of behavioral health service delivery and discuss funding and the use of TANF dollars for substance use disorders. Uh, Dr. Caulfield. Uh, Dr. Caulfield, you might be on mute. Yes, thank you so very much. I want to echo Dennis's opening comments. I feel very grateful to ACP for this opportunity. Uh, I'm very honored to be with such an esteemed group of panelists, and thank you all for joining in today. So many people ask, what is a managing entity? Well, in the state of Florida, um, we were mandated by the legislature uh, to be privatized. Uh, originally, Department of Children and Families held the contract for serving those individuals in our state that were indigent and uninsured with mental health and substance abuse disorders. Next slide. And the legislature decided that they wanted to move that responsibility from the Department of Children and Families. And so they privatized this to the general population. And LSF, Lutheran Services Florida, was one of seven managing entities that was awarded a contract. And so our role is to manage a group of 56 service providers uh, that are comprised of hospitals, detox units, community mental health centers, drop-in centers, most any type of organization that touches behavioral health care services and offers them. Uh, and our funding is very restricted to those that are indigent and uninsured in the state of Florida. We are really the safety net for our vulnerable citizens who have no other means to obtain the help they need. Next slide, please. So as I said, we were mandated uh, to come into uh, the private sector 2012. There are seven managing entities. We are the second largest in the state. Our budget is $152 million. For those of you that aren't aware, Florida ranks 50th now in the nation for funding for behavioral health care services. So it's always a challenge for us. And I spend a lot of time at the Capitol during session educating our legislators, presenting to committee hearing meetings, uh, doing whatever I can to raise awareness for the desperate need for funding for individuals that are living with mental health and substance abuse disorders. So each year, the Department of Children and Families provides each managing entity with a schedule of funds, and that's who we are contracted with. And the funding is a combination of state and federal funds. Some funds are very restricted in their use, and they have to be used for specific programs and services, and other funds are more flexible within the categories of substance abuse or mental health. In the case of TANF, uh, those are uh, shared with us in both the categories of substance abuse and mental health. And if we want to shift those funds from one category to another, let's say from mental health and put more dollars into our substance abuse TANF bucket, if you will, um, we have to apply with the state of Florida, the Department of Children and Families, to request that they consider our need for more money, let's say, for substance abuse TANF as opposed to mental health TANF. So it's a process. Next slide. This is our service area. We cover 23 counties, which is a third of the state of Florida. And we cover five circuits in the state of Florida. So our reach is very broad and we have a lot of 
rural counties, as well as urban counties, and each county brings its own unique needs, own unique service gaps, if you will, in the delivery system. And so as a managing entity, we are responsible for managing this network of provider organizations, providing the compliance oversight, making sure that the state dollars are managed in a, in a good stewardship manner. And we have 56 outstanding provider organizations, as I mentioned, that serve 23 counties. Next slide. So a little bit about uh, LSF Health Systems. Uh, these are the various divisions in our organization. And if you notice, we have clinical, we have care coordination, we have a compliance division, data, finance, housing, because we know housing is healthcare. And we know that our individuals that are homeless are, aren't apt to really follow a treatment plan if they're worried about where their next place they're going to have, if they're gonna have a roof or not over their heads. Uh, and so that's a very, very much a part of our offerings to our treatment providers. We have a training institute, uh, resource development, because many of our providers do not have the funds to have a grant writer, for example. So we partner with our providers to try to bring in more funding in our service delivery. Uh, to date, we brought in, due to our grant writing collaborations with our providers, an additional $12.5 million in the last three years. So we're responsible for making sure that our providers are utilizing evidence-based practices and protocols. Uh, again, that we're uh, making sure that the finances the funding is utilized uh, as, as it's been delivered to our providers, and we're very much collaborative in our approach. There's no gotcha kind of mentality. It's more, if you're struggling, we'll send our teams in, offer TA. We want to be successful. If our providers are successful, we're successful. Next slide. So some of the services that we fund uh, to our providers, as you can see, supportive employment, TANF, which we'll be talking about today, uh, short-term res, substance abuse detox, respite beds, supported housing. Uh, we have what's called FIT teams, family intervention teams, FIS teams, uh, PATH dollars. Next slide. We offer aftercare services, day and night treatment, drop-in centers, crisis support, case management, uh, FAT teams. Next slide. In-home on-site services, inpatient, uh, mental health clubhouses, prevention, outreach, methadone maintenance to address the opioid epidemic. Uh, Florida was very hard hit with this situation. Uh, we were kind of leading the nation with pill mills um, until uh, that was shut down. So it's it's been quite a hotbed for individuals that are addicted to opioids. Next slide showcases our funding for supportive employment. Uh, basically, the funding that we receive for supportive employment from the Department of Children and Families specifically targets the severe and persistent mentally ill population. Uh, as I said earlier, many of our dollars come in from the state and they're very prescribed. There's not a lot of flexibility. So again, uh, for the support of employment, uh, we are to target the SPMI population and the funding that we receive, which is $375,000, allows us to fund three clubhouses that offer supportive employment opportunities. I'm sure that you're a bit surprised because we serve 23 counties, 
and that's a, a small amount of our budget. Uh, however, again, every year, and our fiscal year begins July 1, uh, we are provided a schedule of funds from the Department of Children and Families, and they come in cost centers. We have about 50 different cost centers, supportive employment being one, TANF being another, and we're allowed at 1.6 million for mental health TANF. And those services are to include case management, outpatient, residential, and in-home on-site. Next slide. So our monies that we receive for the mental health TANF allows our providers to create individualized treatment plans. They're developed and employment services are typically referred to our community providers, um, such as Workforce Development, Operation New Hope, that works very closely with individuals that have been incarcerated and coming back into uh, the community, needing job skills and job training, and so on. The town of substance abuse funding that we receive is 1.08 million, and again, the same kinds of treatments are provided through the TANF substance abuse funding, such as case management, all that I've discussed that mental health TANF covers as well. And as I mentioned earlier, we have to receive DCF approval, Department of Children and Families approval, if we wanna shift the monies from these two categories, from mental health TANF to substance abuse TANF or vice versa. Next slide. This is just uh, to show that we have many other offerings as a managing entity, just uh, such as our access to care line, which is available 24 seven for our constituents to call. It's manned with our clinical staff that are available. Uh, to advocate, to help individuals access treatment. Um, we have brief screening and, and referral, et cetera, on our access to care line. I wanna talk a little bit about the peer specialist training that we brought on board as a result of the state now reimbursing for certified peer specialist individuals as well as our Medicaid managed care plans. They're now reimbursing for certified recovery peer specialist. And when that occurred, our providers were very happy that that had occurred, that they could now employ certified recovery peer specialist. Uh, however, there was such a dearth of recovery peer specialist available uh, for a variety of reasons. So we partnered with Jacksonville University, a local university here in Jacksonville. And uh, we also obtained a HRSA grant to be able to develop a curriculum, 40 hour required curriculum, so that our peer specialist individuals with lived experience that wanted to share their experience and help others. We developed the curriculum that would be most helpful for them. Uh, it includes wraparound. Uh, it includes trauma-informed care, mental health first aid, and other courses to prepare them. Uh, they also, here in the state of Florida, are required to have 500 hours of on-site experience working with clients. And so our 56 provider organizations serve as internship sites, if you will so that these individuals can get their required hours and then they can sit for the state certification exam. We find that this is a wonderful employment incentive for those that are coming into recovery, that want to share their experiences, that want to give back, and it has really opened up a whole new network if you will, of individuals that we find are really serving as linchpins to motivate individuals 
to get into treatment. Uh, we're utilizing peer specialists in hospital emergency rooms. We're using them in OBGYN practices uh, to target women that are currently using and are pregnant or are at risk for uh, having NAS babies. Uh, we're utilizing them in primary care offices uh, and so on. So we're finding that that is a great tool. Uh, it's a win-win for both individuals that are searching for jobs that perhaps have records that are preventing them from being considered for employment elsewhere to readily find positions in our treatment milieu. That concludes my formal presentation and I thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Caulfield, for that valuable information, uh, particularly about the use of TANF dollars. Very interesting. Uh, we want to move on to our second poll question here, which is, does your state count treatment as a work activity and or defer or exempt substance users from work requirements? Options are yes, no, or I don't know. I'll give you a couple seconds to weigh in on that one. Thank you for sharing our that poll. It looks like we have 62% responding yes, 16% of folks on the line say no, and 22% are not sure. At this point, we'd like to turn the webinar over to Kim Relaford. Good afternoon. I'm Targeted assessment program. I want to thank the Office of Family Assistance for inviting us to share our program with you today. We are very proud of the work our staff do every day and we are grateful for the opportunity granted us by our state's Cabinet for Health and Family Services to assist Kentucky's most vulnerable families. Next slide please. Today I will be sharing our program with you focusing on services provided to TANF recipients enrolled in the Kentucky Works Program or KWP. KWP is the program that ensures participation of TANF recipients in work readiness activities. I will provide a quick history of TAP's implementation, our referral process, and the key practices we employ. I will also review TAP outcomes and follow-up study data relevant to employment and employment readiness. But first, a brief summary of what we know about TANF recipients with substance abuse disorders. Low-income parents are not unique in their tendency to hide their substance use. TAP participants have shared their feelings of being judged, fears of disclosure leading to legal problems, loss of benefits, and a fear that they have consistently shared with us that they will lose their children. And these have led them to not report their substance use or seek treatment. These fears lead to underreporting, particularly when a generic screening or referral method is used. Screening and assessment conducted by trained professionals is more likely to encourage disclosure and increase acceptance of treatment recommendations. An assessment process which views addiction as a chronic but very much manageable illness and employs intensive case management and a coordinated approach to service delivery increases the likelihood of treatment engagement. Next slide, please. 
Addressing only identified substance use disorders is ineffective as it seldom presents alone. Multiple barriers to include substance use, intimate partner violence, adverse childhood experiences, lifelong trauma, and low education levels are often combined with unmet, unmet basic needs, and they are strongly linked to non-participation in work activities and poor employment outcomes. Substance abuse barriers to employment are not limited to parents who are actively using. In the case of John, the mother of his children was the one in active addiction. John's former girlfriend had their children removed from her care after her substance use put the children in danger. John was underemployed and then lost his job once his children came to live with him because his infant daughter had special needs and his son was struggling with being separated from his mother. John was a former substance user and had served time in prison related to his drug use. When John enrolled in KWP, he began volunteering at the animal shelter to meet service requirements, but was struggling with meeting these requirements as well as meeting the needs of his children. His case manager referred him to TAP. His assessment revealed he would benefit from counseling for support and relapse prevention as he adapted to his new role as full-time custodian of his children. With TAP's assistance, he initiated in-home services with First Steps, which is a program for medically fragile children under three, applied for housing assistance, and enrolled in parenting classes. TAP also referred John to Reform, the Fatherhood Opportunities for Reentry and Mobility program, which focuses on strengthening positive father-child engagement, improving employment and economic mobility, and improving healthy family relationships. Through this program, he engaged in job readiness that assisted him in obtaining stable employment despite his felony. Next slide, next slide please. John's story illustrates how the University of Kentucky's targeted assessment program is one promising approach to increasing employment outcomes for TANF recipients in Kentucky. Next slide. TAP is a partnership between DCBS and the University of Kentucky. TAP services are free of charge to participants and are funded by TANF dollars to assist Kentucky's low-income parents to address barriers to self-sufficiency and safety within federally mandated timeframes. In Kentucky, the lifetime limit for receiving TANF benefits is 60 months. Next slide. TAP was initiated as a pilot in fiscal year 2000 in order to assist Kentucky's TANF recipients in identifying and addressing their barriers to self-sufficiency. Since 2000, TAP has expanded eight times. The most recent expansion was initiated in October of 2018 when DCBS received funding through the Kentucky Opioid Response Effort to expand TAP services into counties identified as having the highest rates of opioid overdoses and fatalities. TAP currently co-locates co on-site at the DCBS offices 15, 57 targeted assessment specialists, or as we call them assessors, in 35 Kentucky counties. These counties were selected by factors such as the number of TANF recipients and child welfare cases. Once the expansion has been once the expansion has been completely implemented, there will be actually be 72 assessors in 43 counties. Assessors are clinically trained and have the equivalent of a master's degree plus three years of experience in treatment and assessment in three of five areas, substance use, mental health, intimate partner violence, learning issues, and women's issues. The women's issues focus is imperative because the majority of our referrals are women. These clinically trained assessors provide holistic and comprehensive assessment, referral, pre-treatment, intensive case management, and ongoing follow-up services to assist referred participants in overcoming identified barriers, including barriers to employment. Next slide, please. Referrals to TAP can be made in many ways. TAP tries to ensure that a piece of paper or a process does not impede the referring case manager or CPS worker from making the referral. Next slide. To be eligible for TAP or services, participants must be the parent or caretaker of at least one dependent child and be TANF eligible, meaning at or below 200% of poverty. Most referrals are received from DCVS, but referrals from outside agencies and self-referrals that meet the income guidelines can also be accepted. Next slide. Referrals from DCBS and specifically from KWP are made after a case manager completes the initial assessment as part of eligibility termination. These screenings identify barriers to employment, education, and other barriers to include physical and mental health, substance use, intimate partner violence, and learning needs. 
If during that assessment it is determined the applicant would benefit from TAP services, the case manager routinely makes a referral electronically through OTIS, which is the online tracking information system that Kentucky uses. This tracks participation in both allowable and countable components. TAP is considered an allowable component, meaning that recipients can participate for a brief time in a component that is not countable towards the state's participation rate. TAP does not count per se towards at participation hours, but it can be used to meet the recipient's work readiness requirements. Next slide. TAP utilizes several key practices, and I would like to share a few of those with you. Next slide, please. Co-location of the assessors in the DCBS office is the first key practice. Being on site allows for easier access for participants to engage in TAP services. It also fosters strong collaborative relationships with DCBS during the determination of participation requirements as well as ongoing shared decision making between TAP, DCBS, and the participant throughout the life of the case. For us, relationships, whether it's with our, our case managers or our caseworkers or with the participant is key to everything. TAP participants begin services by completing a holistic assessment which identifies both participant barriers and strengths. From initial engagement and throughout the life of the case, assessors employ motivational interviewing and strength-based case management, including pretreatment and service coordination to address the identified barriers. To illustrate our key practices, I'd like to share Callie's story. Callie, a 32-year-old married mother of a 12-year-old son, was referred to TAP by her KWP case manager. At the time of the referral, she had recently separated and filed for an emergency protection order from her husband of 14 years. She had been, she had been abused throughout the relationship, which began when she was 16. Because of the abuse, she had suffered miscarriages and the death of a child shortly after his birth. To cope with the ongoing abuse and trauma, she began abusing prescription opioids, but at the time of the TAP assessment, she was engaged in medication-assisted treatment and had been in recovery for three years. However, she had not received trauma-focused treatment services to address her history of abuse and was reporting symptoms indicative of depression and PTSD. Next slide, please. Callie was unemployed at the time of the assessment, but had worked and attended college in the past. Because her former partner had made threats to harm her and her son, she was afraid of going to work or participating in community services. On the recommendation of TAP, DCBS granted a temporary exemption from KWP activity so she could engage in treatment and receive supportive services through the local domestic violence program. She had successes and setbacks, but after several months of regular attendance and trauma-focused treatment, she was ready to move forward and started completing her community service hours. The agency valued her work and offered her a position that provided on-the-job training and led to a full-time employment. TAP assisted her with obtaining a vehicle and a driver's license. She completed formal mental health treatment, but continued to receive MAT. She continues to attend aftercare counseling, and she's active in her women's survivor support group. TAP assisted Callie and John by making individualized recommendations, utilizing motivational interviewing to engage them in progressing through the stages of change and fully engaging in recommended services. Next slide. Through strength-based case management, Callie and John were able to resolve basic needs and other barriers that interfered with their engagement in treatment and their ability to successfully participate in work readiness activities. The TAP practice of motivational interviewing and strength-based case management are key to resolving the internal and external barriers that impede successful employment outcomes for TANF recipients. Next slide, please. TAP's ability to assist participants to address their barriers to self-sufficiency hinges on ongoing communication with a referring case manager and follow-up with the participant and their treatment providers to increase treatment retention. Assessors provide both formal and informal education to KWP case managers on substance use disorders and evidence-based practices, thus increasing their understanding of the unique needs of TANF recipients. Next slide, please. I shared two examples of TAP services, but I would also like to share outcome and follow-up study data to illustrate how TAP improves employment outcomes for Kentucky's TANF recipients. Next slide. TAP data collection uses an encrypted web-based system approved by UK's Internal Review Board. Outcome data are collected at baseline and at case closure. 
Next slide. TAP completed 3,053 case closure reviews for participants who terminated services during fiscal year 2019. Of the participants who terminated services, 68% or 2,072 received a baseline assessment. I'd like to say that that's, we, we're very proud of that number because well, oftentimes TANF recipients and, and the population that we serve are very difficult to um, engage and connect with and um, they are very transient and so we work very hard to get as many folks in and get them assessed as we can. Assessed participants were on, assessed participants were on average 32 years old, white, married, female and had 2.4 children. 28% had less than a high school diploma and average working 12 and a half hours a week. Next slide. 76% of assist, assessed participants were identified with mental health barriers, 57% with substance use barriers, 42% with intimate partner violence barriers, and 15% with learning problems. Next slide. Assessed participants also had significant unmet needs, the most common being housing, transportation, and social supports, but you can also see they struggle with parenting, physical health, legal help, and, and they're meeting their children's needs. Next slide, please. At termination, 83% of participants assessed with a substance abuse these barrier showed progress in addressing their barriers. 82% of participants with mental health barriers, 83% with an intimate partner violence barrier, and 56% with learning problems also showed progress in addressing their barriers. Next slide, please. In fiscal year 2019, over two-thirds of TAP participants who are enrolled in KWP participated in a countable work activity within six months of completing the TAP assessment. However, the average amount of time to enrollment was just seven weeks. More than 75% of assessed participants identified with work readiness as a barrier at baseline showed progr progress in work readiness and work skills to include progress in applying for employment, obtaining employment, participating in job training, and in continuing education. Next slide, please. TAP conducted a six-month follow-up study with participants who completed a baseline interview during fiscal year 2000. 322 subjects were selected by a regionally proportionate stratified random sample. Next slide, please. Statistically significant decreases from baseline to six-month follow-up were found in mental health symptoms, substance use, intimate partner violence, percentage of open welfare cases, and percentage of work difficulties. Reliance on TANF decreased and employment increased. Next slide. Mental health, substance use, intimate partner violence, and learning problem barriers reported by participants at baseline also significantly decreased at follow-up. Next slide. Transportation, children's needs, and, and child care needs self-reported at baseline decreased significantly at follow-up as well. Next slide. Significant improvements in employment-related outcomes, specifically decreases in work problems and increase in employment were found. Next slide. Those reporting receiving TANF at baseline decreased significantly at follow-up, and similarly, participants involved with child welfare at baseline decreased at follow-up. Next slide. TAP success is based on key practices of holistic assessment, strength-based case management, motivational interviewing, and ongoing engagement with pretreatment and service coordination. Another key is collaboration on each participant case with DCBS and community service providers, which is strengthened by co-location of TAP assessors with DCBS. Community level collaboration is integral to the TAP model. Um, next slide, please. This includes active and ongoing advisory councils to ensure successful implementation and identification of barriers to access and gaps in services in the community. Community-based hiring ensures that candidates selected is a good fit for the local DCBS office. We actually employ a selection committee that is made up of local DCBS, 
and providers and our four barriers, which include intimate partner violence, substance abuse, mental health, and learning issues. And, um, and of course, TAP, TAP staff are also part of that selection committee. We use a standardized behavioral style interview that allows for us to give the, have the opportunity to um, really see not what they think they would do in a situation, but to actually to demonstrate their experiences in certain situations. Um, we also uh, tap managers and assessors participate in local and regional state work groups and task force to continuously provide support in identifying barriers to services and in meeting the unique needs of TANF eligible recipients. Next slide. The slide deck available for download includes a list of references used in this presentation. Next slide. Here's my contact information, as well as the contact information for TAPS leadership and my collaborators in the development of this presentation. We welcome your questions and please feel free to contact any of us. Next slide. Thank you for your time and attention and I look forward to answering your questions. Kim, thank you for that, that great information and those awesome results from TAP. We can see why you are proud of those accomplishments. Uh, we appreciate you sharing that. So for our third poll question, we wanted to know which case management model does your organization follow? You can select all that apply here, intensive case management, motivational interviewing, strength-based case management, or perhaps you don't know at this time. We'll give you a couple moments to consider and vote on those options. Okay, great. Thanks to you for participating in the poll. It looks like we have just under 40% of folks responding that their organization follows intensive case management, 49% uh, at motivational interviewing, 70% talking about strengths-based case management, and just about 14% not sure. So thank you for participating. Um, at this point, we are going to move into our question and answer portion of the webinar. So thank you to each of our great presenters who provided a wealth of information on supporting the behavioral health and employment outcomes of those with substance use disorders. So as we move into questions and answers, please submit your questions using the question box on the right. And if you have a question for a specific presenter, please do state so in your submission. I'm going to open up the floor to questions and the first question that has come in for our speakers. How does employment or job training and prep, job training and prep contribute to recovery for those with substance use disorders? And I open it up to any of our speakers to uh, jump in. Well, thank you. This is Christine and I can tell you that um, having a job creates purpose. And for those that are in recovery, um, it's very important that they have structure and they also report that they feel that they are contributing and their life now has meaning. Uh, they're mainstreamed into the workforce, whether that's through uh, our certified peer specialist opportunities uh, or other opportunities that they are able to secure. And I find that people report that having a job is really transformational and mm -hmm. changes their life, allows them to get adequate housing. If that's been a deficit for them, get their children back if they have been removed, uh, et cetera. So it certainly serves as a vehicle to improve recovery odds on so many levels. Great, thank you, Christine. 
This is Dennis, uh, and just to chime in as well, um, uh, from a uh, behavioral health recovery lens, uh, we truly see that there are four uh, legs of the stool for ensuring uh, recovery and um, uh, really returning back to the community. Uh, the four stools are health, housing, community, a sense of belonging, and education and or work, which leads, uh, as, as it's been already stated, it leads to a sense of purpose. So those four stools are, are, are sort of the, the key markers for supporting recovery. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and combine two questions that have come in. Uh, the first is what resources are available uh, excuse me, what resources are available to help us identify employers who are willing to work with individuals with substance use issues? And then a piggyback on that question is how do you handle employer engagement and get buy-in from employers to hire those with substance use issues? I, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, that's not one thing. TAP doesn't specifically go out and recruit employers for folks with felonies. But from my experiences, um, it really is an you can't just tell people that we need to hire felons. You need to um, meet with with reentry councils in Kentucky. One of the things that they have done successfully is go out and, and, and employ the employers to be part of their reentry councils to get them to the table so that they can learn about, you know, the barriers to employment why they would be good, um, good good employees if they took a chance on them, and then to have other um, businesses who have actually employed um, former felons to talk about what those experiences have been like and how transformative as using um, uh, Catherine's word is that it really does make a difference in their life to be employed and to to speak to them on that personal level and get them to be part of that community identity of wrapping around services for folks who are leaving prisoner jail. Great, thank you. Um, next question for how does LSF accommodate clients from diverse religious backgrounds, including those who do not identify with one specific religion? I believe this is for Dr. Caulfield. Sure, and that's that's a great question. And we certainly do not, uh, not only do we not require individuals that come to work uh, at Lutheran Services Florida be L Lutheran, for example, uh, in fact, our religious um, orientation and affiliation is is never never asked. Uh, but we, as a faith based organization, um, we have the values that we uphold, but we certainly don't um, push them on others, if you will. So we don't require our provider networks, if you will, our providers that are in our network of care, to have a specific faith-based orientation, uh, quite the contrary. You know, our mission is to focus on the individuals in need, regardless of what their religious affiliation might be. And uh, again, our target are individuals in communities that are indigent and uninsured. Great, thank you. Um, and a question for Kim. With high barrier populations, what do you consider job readiness activities? Um, well, I will say it can be a multitude of different things. It can be community service to just give them the opportunity to feel comfortable, um, job coaching um, when there are particularly with our folks with SPMI populations or severe, particularly around the severe anxiety and social anxieties. A lot of times job coaches can go on site with them and kind of coach them through that or to identify employment that they can do that won't um, won't trigger their their symptoms. Um, 
it can, but it's also things like uh, getting them, you know, into treatment and and to and getting them into that the wellness portion of managing their illnesses, whether it's mental health or substance use, because once they can successfully manage those, then the employment piece kind of can be overlaid to that. Um, but job readiness activities in Kentucky are multitude depending on the needs of the specific individual, like the reform program that I talked about, or um, uh, just community service pro programs, um, job readiness activity is, you know, truly just treat, teaching them how to apply for jobs and to fill out resumes, skills that some of us may take for granted, but for some folks have never been taught, um, just about being good employees, um, showing up on time. So it can be, a, you know, it really can be very specific and concrete to more, ex uh, to more co uh, Com complex uh, services depending on the needs of the participant. Great, thank you. And I really appreciate folks sending in all these great questions. Um, we have a question here that says, can someone speak to the need for additional methadone clinics and or doctors who provide suboxone for opiate addiction? And a follow-up is, and how these medications affect their ability to pass drug screenings for employment? Well, I can uh, share from a Florida perspective. Um, when I talked about the restrictive nature of, of some of the funding that comes down uh, to us, um, one of the funding streams that came from the federal government combined with the state, uh, initially when we were fighting this opioid epidemic, um, was SOAR dollars, as they're called. And these SOAR dollars allowed us to provide treatment through MAT and Suboxone, but did not allow for any detox, residential beds, uh, et cetera. So they were very prescriptive and could only be utilized for individuals that were suffering from an opioid use disorder. The new dollars that, have, uh, that are reportedly coming down in October have been more flexible or are going to be more flexible, I should say, and now will be allowed to treat individuals with, um, with other disorders, uh, other substance use disorders. We received a certain amount of funding to help individuals through MAT, through Suboxone, uh, and that was the amount that we had to work with. So as far as expansion um, in the state of Florida, again, there frankly hadn't been any new funding for any of these various categories in behavioral health care for decades um, and what typically happens in Florida is, unfortunately, a tragedy occurs. For example, the Marjorie Stoneham Douglas school shooting in the Fort Lauderdale area occurred. And it happened the last two weeks of the Florida legislative session. And the Florida legislators wanted to react and respond. And so they found, uh, quote unquote, $400 million to address it. And that's typically how new funding comes in um, in a state that unfortunately currently is 50th in the nation for funding. So, so we, we have the money. Uh, Pardon I'm me? Sorry, please, I'm sorry, please finish. Oh no, I'm just, uh, I was just gonna add that as a result of this type of, of funding situation, uh, we rely heavily on applying for external grant opportunities to be able to supplement and expand services um, so that we can increase capacity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this, this is Dennis uh, Romero again from SAMHSA here in the regional office. And let me uh, take a, a crack at this question as well and, and help um, uh, in, enlighten uh, the, the audience here. Um, to my colleague, she's uh, absolutely correct. 
the, the funding that came to all the states were what was called, initially was called STR, State uh, Treatment Response Grants. And they were very, very limited. Uh, the idea was just to help provide assistance for medication assisted treatment. Um, and, and, and there were a lot of limitations with them. But the good thing about those funds is that it, it forced providers to look at evidence-based practices as the, the model to use in addressing the opioid uh, crisis. Uh, we had a second round of funding called SOR, which uh, stands for State Opioid Response Grants. And these were a little bit more flexible because we kept saying to Congress, uh, states need a little bit more flexibility uh, to address these issues. Uh, we are, this October will be the third round of funding, which will also be called SOR. And this time we, we uh, um, asked Congress for increased flexibility, particularly because our data shows that the next uh, wave uh, of a crisis is going to be stimulants. And we're seeing that already with methamphetamine, but particularly uh, laced with uh, fentanyl, which as we know, fentanyl and carfentanyl are the are the uh, main um, uh, uh, causes of the uh, overdose deaths. Um, and so that, that has been done. Uh, separate and apart to these particular funding uh, opportunities, we have also tried to address the, the fact that we have a workforce crisis across the healthcare system, across the nation. It, it's not just limited to mental health or substance abuse or uh, MAT programs. Uh, and so we've been working in, in collaboration with our sister agency, the Health Resources and Services Administration, and in particular, the Bureau of Health Workforce, to look at ways that we could partner to, to, to um, invest in, in the behavioral health uh, workforce. So one of the things that we, we reached agreement on and, and are partnering on, um, and we got approval from, from uh, uh, Congress and, and uh, leadership, is to leverage HRSA's um, national, um, uh, national Health Service Corps, which is uh, a program within HRSA that funds, helps support um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, con the connection of providers uh, in, in health who may still have uh, medical uh, loans or school loans. Uh, that through this uh, program, their medical, uh, their school loans are either forgiven completely or partially forgiven. Um, and in return, they give X amount of time in a uh, recognized needy community. So we have been asking HRSA to consider working uh, on addressing the opioid uh, epidemic. And, and I'm happy to say that last year, for the first time, we held a national um, uh, uh, job fair, virtual job fair. Uh, I actually was the uh, SAMHSA lead uh, when we held the job fair for all of the states east of the Mississippi last February. And the idea was to look at, high, uh, at, bring, at connecting uh, master's level substance abuse uh, clinicians uh, properly licensed in, in their respective states with providers uh, in the healthcare, particularly the FQHCs. This year, we're hoping to be able to do something similar, but with the mental health provider uh, uh, community uh, to, br uh, to bring more pro behavioral health providers into the uh, uh, public health care systems across the nation. Um, right. Separate and apart from that, we have also done, we're promoting the use of medication assisted treatment. And because there's, a, there's not enough physicians who can do this, uh, we have re uh, uh, requested and received approval to create curriculums to train uh, uh, physician assistants and nurse practitioners to also be eligible prescribers of this medication. Great, right. thank you, Dennis. Um, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna, we're gonna have time for one more question um, that can provide an opportunity for all three speakers to respond if you wish, and then we will have one more whole question for the audience, and then we will do a quick closing. So thank you again, everyone, for writing in these fantastic questions. Um, we will close with, what are the potential benefits of braiding TANF dollars for mental health services with TANF for substance use treatment?
Uh, I'll, is, I'll quickly uh, go ahead, say, thank you. Uh, I'll quickly say that um, anytime that we're able to legally um, braid funding, not not commingle, but braid funding uh, in support of behavioral health, I'm 100% all for it. The reality is that behavioral health is 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 under um, uh, underfunded, but but the real reason why it's underfunded is because of the and it's really beyond the scope of this conversation, but it's really because we look at behavioral health from the standpoint of a, as a social issue. And we need to look at this as a, as a healthcare issue. And if we switch it, we will be able to be a little bit more organized in addressing uh, these issues. Thank you. And just dovetailing on what Dennis uh, has shared, uh, I think that I definitely agree. The more flexible our funding can be, the more we're going to be able to serve individuals quickly. Um, when I talked about the need for us to receive permission, if you will, uh, from the Department of Children and Families to shift substance abuse TANF to mental health TANF dollars or vice versa, it often takes you know, time for them to move that request from our region on to our capital in, in Tallahassee. And, um, and and so it the time lag sometimes uh, really is problematic. So the more funding that can be braided, whether it be TANF or any other types of funding streams, I think it's going to better serve uh, our individuals that we serve as well. I agree with uh, both the other speakers. I think that, um, I think when we see uh, behavioral health issues in a silo as separate from physical health or ha are happening separately and we fund them separately, we miss the bigger picture of the whole person and seeing things from an integrative health standpoint. Uh, but I also know that given the opportunity of good state leadership, there are opportunities for um, not maybe not braiding, but, but um, finding ways to use all the pots of money to be more integrated. So for example, um, I think one of the biggest things that has really made a difference in Kentucky is that we were able to take advantage of Medicaid expansion, which then started sort of, uh, being able to pay for substance use treatment. It was a huge difference that we serve um, it made a huge difference because then we could send them to treatment and their Medicaid could pay for those services so um, you know I think creativity is probably what's going to it, it's going to take in the short run but in the long run it really does need to be seen as an integrated service need and not just pots of money for specific issues thank you Great. Thank you again to all of our speakers for their responses and to our audience for sending in such great questions. At this point, we will move into our last poll question. Yes, yeah, and that's simply uh, we'd like to know from you what topics you'd like to see in future webinars as we are planning uh, to make sure that we are providing information that's useful and applicable to what you are doing. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to James to close us out. Thanks, everyone. Uh, and so, um, as always, um, and, and also for those who may be joining us for the first time, uh, a transcript and audio recording of today's webinar will be available um, on the POTA network site, um, and you will see the, that link before you. We'd also like to hear from you about future webinar topics, as Steve just mentioned, and you have an opportunity to um, send those to us um, in the previous slide. Um, and also, the website is, is indicated on the screen as well. Um, you can also help us expand our network by um, referring people to us who may your, your, your colleagues um, who may be interested in any of these in information. Uh, thanks to everyone who participated in today's webinar, especially Dennis, Christine, and Kim. Um, we also 
um, thank all of you for joining us today. Um, always at the end of our webinars, we, we, we will launch a quick survey um, to complete today's webinar that will appear in a separate pop-up window um, when the webinar ends. Your feedback is important to us, so and it will help us um, inform future webinars. So if you could please take a few minutes to respond to the survey. Thank you, thank you, thank you again for your time today, and we look forward to your participation in our future webinars, um, one of which you'll be coming up towards the end of March. Um, so uh, look forward to details about that coming out on the PRTA website. Thanks again, everyone, and have a pleasant remainder of your day.